How many of you have your Bibles? Have you got your Bibles? All right. If you do, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And as we turn there, we are also kind of turning a corner in the book of Ephesians. And uh, I want to remind us of the purpose of the letter. We spoke on this in the introduction uh, way back uh, uh, many, many months ago when we started. And I just want to remind you of this again, because really, in the sim to me, in the simplest possible terms, there are really just two themes, two basic themes in the New Testament. The one is, is how people are redeemed, how we are rescued from sin and how we're saved, how we're, we're um, liberated from the bondage of, of the spirit of the age and all of those things and how we're restored to the Lord. Amen. That's, that's, that's theme number one, how we're brought into right relationship with him. That's the simplest way of saying it. That's one major theme uh, in the New Testament. And the second one is how those of us who are truly saved, born again of the Lord, how we continue to live in relationship with the Lord and with one another. Those are our two themes that we see throughout the New Testament. And the book of Ephesians is certainly no, um, no change in that. What we have always said and maintained from the beginning is that Ephesians is divided up into two sections. Chapters 1 through 3 deal with whose we are. We are the Lord's, and so we are God's people. This is what he has done for us in redemption in our hearts and in our lives through and in Jesus Christ. That's the first three chapters. Within that is also the reminder that as Gentile believers, and I think all of us are, are probably Gentile believers. I'm not sure anyone here is, is, is a Jewish believer, but we have been brought into the family of God along with the Jewish people under and in Jesus Christ. That's the first three chapters, and that kind of covers that first theme that, that I talked about that we found throughout the Bible. How do we get into re right relationship with God? What is that all about? And then chapters four through six cover that second theme, which is now, how do we live? So the Lord has come and he has redeemed us, but now how do we live that out in our lives? In chapters four through six, the apostle Paul deals with that. And so that's what we're going to be beginning. We're going to begin that journey now on, on a practical level. And, and I want to stress this to you one more time. And I'm hoping that the Lord will get really put this on our hearts because I think this is something that we ache for and that we long for. And that is legitimacy in the Christian life, reality in the Christian life, not just the talking about it, We've covered this for, for many, many years now that Christianity is not just mental assent. It is not just that we rattle off a statement of faith and say, this is what I believe. And because I believe it up here, I'm saved. Christianity is far more than that. Christianity is not primarily about information. It's about transformation. And we have to understand that and recognize that. And what I'm praying for is that, that as we move into chapters four through six, this one thought will permeate our hearts each and every week as we go through verse by verse. And that is that you and I, we really can change. We really can change. And maybe you say, I don't need any change. Fine, if you've arrived, great. We'll all come and worship at your altar. But for those of us that say we know the Lord still has some more work to do in our hearts and in our lives, outwardly as we, and as we express it, then I want you to be encouraged. Because the one thing that I find that is, is very devious from the enemy and it's something that can really afflict us is a cynical nature of saying, you know what, I've tried again and again. I've come to the Lord with something over and over and over. And there are these besetting sins or these attitudes that, that I can't seem to get over the hump. And I believe God and I know he's able and I see all this in his word. But I see in my life, perhaps I see in family members' lives who claim to be saved as well and who I believe know the Lord. I just see no change. And that causes a cynicism. That can cause us to be really depressed and to want to give up. And so I'm hoping that as we move forward into chapter 4, 5, and 6, that, that, that I can communicate to you and that the Word of God by His Spirit will communicate to us that change really is possible. And that don't give up. 
Don't stop. No matter what, I don't care if you've been at this thing for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or 50 years or 60 years, however long you've been serving the Lord and then you're saying, I'm getting discouraged, don't. And don't give up because I believe that Ephesians 4 through 6, just as chapters 1 through 3, will give us some, some, uh, some encouragement in how true change is possible. Okay, so that was a little bit of an introduction. Now we begin and we're just going to read. And I'm going to read, we're going to read through the first three verses but we're really going to concentrate today just on verse one. So chapter four and verse one, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, and this is the apostle Paul writing, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of, of peace. And I want to talk today about what it means to walk worthy of our calling. As believers, what does it mean to walk worthy of our calling? And I'm going to ask if you'd bow your heads one more time and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we seek you. We seek your strength. We seek your help today. We can do nothing outside of you, but with you, all things are possible. And so I pray today that you would open our eyes, open our ears. I pray if any here are coming in and maybe they really are discouraged. Maybe the spirit of the age has created a cynicism in them. Maybe they look around and they just say, this whole thing of Christianity, it sounds nice and I've, I've believed it and I've wanted to live it out. But, oh, it just seems like nothing changes and no one changes and there's no progress spiritually. Well, Lord, I pray today, if anyone has come in with that, that attitude, that today that that would change. That today that within them there would be fostered afresh and anew, rekindled, um, Lord, a faith, a belief in you, Lord, because you are greater. Lord, you're even greater than our own heart. Sometimes our own heart would condemn us. And yet First John tells us that you are greater even than that. And so I pray today, afresh and anew, that we would believe you, that we would believe you for change in our lives and that we would pray and believe you for change corporately in the church. And Lord, that we would be the people that you have called us to be, loving you, honoring you, walking worthy of the calling you have called us to. And we'll give you the honor and the praise and the glory. We ask all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so, you know, up to this point in the letter, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul has asked us to do nothing except to simply remember who we are, to remember that at one time we were alienated from God, we were separated from God, but now to be in those first three chapters to be reminded of the goodness of God, of the grace of God, of who we are in Jesus Christ. And those have been amen chapters. Those have been great, and we need to continually be reminded of these things. And I'll tell you why. Because we live in this world. We live in a, a, a place where, again, the spirit of the age, and Satan, of course, is the god of this present world, small g in that sense. We live in this world, and we will constantly be barraged and told that, hey, we are, we are not God's people. You are not different. There's nothing changed in your life. And Satan would love to club us over the head again and again and remind us of those things. So it's good that we dwell on those first three chapters and that we are reminded that, that we have now been accepted in Jesus Christ. I say hallelujah. You should say hallelujah. We should be mind, mindful of these things and say this to one another and to ourselves again and again and again. And so those three chapters, great. We've been reminded of God's goodness, of the, of the marvelous salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And now, as we move into chapter 4, the apostle Paul writes, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. All of a sudden now, with all the force possible, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul is going to exhort us to live in a manner worthy of our calling. Now it is not just what has God done internally in me, but now it is let that begin to express itself out. Let the life now be changed and be more like Jesus Christ. 
I don't, come on, folks. Now, how many of you here, you've already arrived. You're just like Jesus. And if everyone else here were called to give an account today, including the people you live with, the people that know you best, how many people? You say, yeah, and everyone would testify I'm just like Jesus. 24-7. I, I mean, I am always just like Jesus Christ in all my actions, in all my words, in every decision I make. It, I mean, seriously, is that us? That's not us. But Paul says, I'm now going to urge you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And a lot of that we'll deal with, we'll get into it next week, with the attitude that we bring to the table, both before the Lord and before one another in verses 2 and 3. But today I just want to kind of focus in on that first verse. And so Paul says, I therefore... And, and, and so what's a therefore? Whenever you read that and you read either wherefore or therefore... What does that harken back to? That tells you that because of something else, now or therefore, this needs to be true. And so Paul immediately begins and he says, folks, on the basis of the great Christian truths that we have regarding sin and salvation, as well as this, the mystery of this unity of what God has done, bringing Jew and Gentile together in the body of Christ, on the basis of all of this, Paul now says the conclusion is that now we have to live the life that God has called us to live. Amen. It is no longer good enough to simply say, I believe this. That's what religions do. That's what religions all over the world. Well, this is what I believe. And because I believe it, I am this. I am a Muslim. I am a Buddhist. I am a Hindu. I am whatever because of just the mental word, because of just our mental ascent and the words that we express. This is now who I am. Can I tell you in Christianity, it cannot be that way. We now must be exhorted. The power of Christ is within us. The Holy Spirit abides within us. We've been brought into God's kingdom. We have been blessed beyond measure. Now it is time for us to live it out. Amen. We must live it out. Therefore, Paul says, I want you to begin to live a different life because of what God has already done. And then he says, I love this because he says, he reminds us of something he told us in chapter 3. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Remember he said that in chapter 3 and verse 1, same thing, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. So Paul wants to remind them again, you say, well, he just said this. Well, he wants to remind them again, he says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. And by the way, I think this can take on, there can be two connotations here. Number one, we know that Paul was actually under house arrest. He is actually a prisoner for the Lord because of his belief in Jesus Christ. Going to jail is not the worst thing that can happen to a Christian if it's because of our stand for Jesus Christ. Now, it better not be because we've done bad things. There's nothing good in that. That's a different matter. But if we are living in a place where Christianity is, is not accepted or not promoted or maybe even outlawed, as some of our brothers and sisters around the world do, being in, in jail is not the worst thing in the world. In fact, for Paul here, he was saying, in a sense, it's kind of like a badge of honor. I, Paul, am the prisoner of the Lord. I am in jail because of Jesus Christ, because of my relationship with him. But there's a second connotation. <coughs> I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Jesus has captured my heart. I used to be a fugitive. I used to be on the run. Every single person that has come to faith in Christ, at one point in time before that, you were an enemy of God. You were running from God. But hallelujah, in fact, Paul kind of uses this language, I think, in the letter to the Philippians, where he says, Christ has apprehended me. He's taken me in. In that sense, you and I as believers, we are prisoners of the Lord. God has captured our heart. He has captured our life. Only we are now willing prisoners in that sense. Amen? Amen. God has come in and he has changed my life. He has control now. And I say, hallelujah. If that's what it means, yes, I too am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Can you say amen to that? So, and, and why does he say this? Because he's trying to let them know that, look, this thing is real for me. I mean, I, I, I'm actually under arrest for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So listen to me. This thing is not theoretical for me. 
If you bring two people before me and one of them has been in jail and been beaten and lost their job and lost everything for the cause of Christ, and then you bring somebody else in that just comes in with their, their hands in their pockets and just, yeah, I'm a Christian too. I've never had one bad thing happen to me for, cause, for the cause of Christ. Hallelujah. It's just all been great. It's been wonderful. It's been fabulous. I'm going to give a little more weight to the guy that's maybe been through the fire. Seriously. Maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you'd give more weight to the guy that's not had to express any uh, loss for Jesus Christ. But I, I'm going to give a little more weight. And so Paul, I think, is reminding them, listen, this thing is real for me. I know of what I speak. So listen to me. And then, he, and then he makes this comment, he says in, in the New King James, I beseech you. Maybe in your version it says, I urge you, or I exhort you, or I encourage you. But this word in the Greek is used 38 times in the New Testament. And it generally does mean some type of, you know, I, I wanna, I, I'm encouraging you to do this. I think oftentimes of coaches that are on the sideline and they're coaching their football team or basketball team or whatever, and the team is going through a rough space. And the coach can tell that the players are wiped out, that they're tired, that they've been, maybe been beaten down, and they're ready just to give up. I remember even running track. Our coach would oftentimes on those, when we'd run the 880 or the mile, and every time I would pass around, you know, along with everybody else, he's like, go, 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 go. It's that type of thing. It's an exhortation of don't give up. Come on. Press through. Move forward. Paul says, I beseech you. I exhort you with everything within me. I'm reminded of the letter to the Hebrews when we're told to exhort one another, to spur one another on. When you spur a horse, what are you doing? You're telling the horse, let's go. Let's go. Pick up the pace. Paul says, after everything that God has done for us that I've mentioned to you in the first three chapters, he says, therefore, now I'm going to beseech you. I'm going to urge you. People say, why do preachers sometimes get loud? Some of them get loud just because they want to put on a show. I hope you know me better than that. This is real for me. This is, and the reason I'm doing this now is because I sense it from the Lord in my heart. And I'm trying to, to give it to you and encourage you. Let's move forward. I exhort you. I urge you. I, I encourage you with everything within me. Let's keep going forward in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Jeremiah said it this way in Jeremiah 38, 20. As he was talking to the, to the people and he was telling them what God was going to do, he says, please obey the Lord and what I am saying to you, that it may go well with you and that you may live. Listen, a, a minister of the gospel, if they've really been called of the Lord, they're not trying to beat people down just to say, hey, I'm on an ego trip. Let me just do this. Let me just, I, I just, I get off on, on having other people get upset or, or get down or whatever. No, not at all. The true minister of the gospel is always exhorting and encouraging for the sake that it would go well with his hearers. That it would go well with those that would hear the message, as Jeremiah said. The Apostle Paul said something similar in 2 Corinthians. That, that the concept here, the idea here, is not I'm beating you down over the head when I'm beseeching you. But it's like that coach. I'm just urging you on with everything within me. Come on, you can make it. We can do this. I beseech you. I exhort you. Amen? Amen. <coughs> Folk, there are too many preachers that are out there that are just telling people what they want to hear. That's all they're doing. Just whatever they, they, they determine, what the crowd, what the desire of the people is, and then they tailor their message to that. So we know, well, most people, they want to have successful lives. They want to have easygoing lives. They want to be the head and not the tail. They don't want to, you know, they want everything to run smooth. So I'm going to bring a message. In fact, in Jeremiah's day, it was the same. There were prophets that were telling the people everything is okay. And they were bringing smooth messages to the people. Oh, God's not upset with us. The, the, the invading armies that we're seeing, the Babylonians and all these different, the Assyrians, whatever, we're not worried. Don't worry. God's going to keep us safe. There's nothing to be concerned about at all. You don't need to repent of anything. We're all fine. Jeremiah, as far as I can tell, one of the only ones that was actually telling the people what they needed to hear. And you and I all can understand this when I mention, when I say it this way. If you've had children, there are often times that you have to say or do something with those kids 
that you know they're not going to like. You know they're going to be, why are you doing this? But why do you do it? For their good. Not because you want them to hate you. Not because you, you want them to be mad. You do it because you love them. And you're trying to exhort them and encourage them and direct them on a good path so that it would go well for them. Amen? And sometimes that means saying things that are not always pleasant, saying things that they don't always want to hear. It's the same with the gospel message. This is why we preach expositorily. We're going to cover everything, and the Lord is going to speak to us through those things. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. So now we get to the heart of it. <clears throat> he says, I beseech you, I encourage you to do something, and it's this, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Folks, so often Christianity is presented to us as if nothing is required of believers. And, and we get this emphasis, and it's a true emphasis, but everything has to be kept in balance. And, and I'll deal with that a little bit more in a minute. But we get this emphasis on our human weakness, on our inability to do anything. And so everything is of the Lord, and we are, once we come to Christ, nothing is required of us. We're just coasting. And it's all about God. First of all, if that were the case, then why is the Apostle Paul saying, I beseech you? He, he's not talking to God. He's not saying, God, I beseech you, make them worthy. No. He's telling them. He's telling us. I'm now encouraging you to cooperate with that which God has already done internally in your heart. Let's cooperate with that. Let's yield to that. Let's make sure we're doing that. If I'm out in the ocean and I'm drowning and, and the, the lifeguard is, is coming in. He's going to save me. And he's got the life preserver and everything. And all I'm doing as I'm going down is fighting him. Don't you give me that. I don't want that life preserver. Don't you do that. Don't you try and put me over top of your back. Don't you grab hold of it. Don't you do that. Well, you know, then I'm going to drown. He's right there. He wants to save me. But see, God has given us a free will, hasn't he? One of the most precious and yet aggravating gifts that every human being has is a free will. Again, I'll use the parent analogy. When we're kids, we like that free will. We get upset at our parents. But then once we become parents, sometimes we're like, if this kid would just listen to me. And so, I see, I got a little bit of response there. And so it's the same with us. So Paul has to say, I beseech you to walk worthy of your calling. Can I tell you something? There is nothing in the New Testament that gives the impression that believers, once we come to Christ, are responsible for nothing. That all our responsibility goes out the door. That God never calls us to anything. That he never requires of us submission, yieldedness, seeking him. No, no, we don't have any of that. There's nothing in the New Testament that indicates that at all. Here's the reality. If God's salvation is good, how many would say God is good and his salvation is good? How many agree with that? I'm not tricking you. Is that an amen? Yes. Is God good? Is his salvation good? This, pretty, this is pretty simple. If God's salvation is good, then let's live like it. It's pretty simple. If it's, if it's good, then live like it. Live it out. Don't, I mean, and, and what does this require? It requires an act of my will. It requires making sure that I'm not on the throne and that I'm allowing Christ on the throne of my heart. See, it's not that God is my co-pilot. And I don't know if anybody has that bumper sticker. I'm not getting on you. I, I truly don't. If you do, then you can scrape it off after service. Um, it's not that God is my co-pilot. That's not good enough. God's the pilot and the co-pilot and everything else. I mean, all I'm, I'm, I'm sitting back there because I don't want control of this thing called my life. But Paul says, still, I beseech you. So I'm going to have to at least, at a minimum, surrender control to him. And that requires an act of my will. Because God has made me a free moral agent, if you would. And that's all of us. And so we've got this, this verb here. He says, I beseech you to walk. Let's talk about this for a minute. He says, I want you to walk because this word occurs eight times in Ephesians. Five times in chapters four and five. And of course, what does it really mean? It's, it's, it's a metaphor. In other words, it just simply means to live a certain way, to behave in a certain way. When he says to walk, he's not saying literally, I want you to now begin to walk north or to walk. But he's talking as a metaphor for the way that we live our lives, our behavior, our conduct. And so in chapter four and verse one, we are called to walk worthy. We just read that. We're called to no longer walk as the Gentiles do in verse 17. 
Then we're called to walk in love in chapter 5 and verse 2. We're called to walk as children of light in chapter 5 and verse 8. We're called to walk carefully and wisely in chapter 5 and verse 15. And all of these are kind of like the literal translations of what's being uh, written there. And so this is a verb, and it denotes a changed manner of living that should characterize us as believers because of our new life in Jesus Christ. And by the way, this should be in all three spheres of our life, privately, publicly, and domestically. In every area of our life, there, when, if we come to Christ, things should change, shouldn't they? If your family does not see a new life of Christ inside of you, then more than likely there's something wrong going on because they should see it above all else. Now, it's easy for us in front of other people to come to church, to come here, come, you know, and in front of others, the Bible study, whatever, and put on the show for an hour or whatever and seem very holy. But our family, the people that are with us 24-7, do they see Christ in our lives? One of the most difficult but rewarding things that we could probably do is go to one another once in a while in our family, if we're for all believers, and say, hey, what do you see in my life? Are there areas that need to change? And if you know they have your best in mind, you can do that. Amen? And so here Paul says, he says, I want you to walk. I want you to behave and live out your life in every area, not just in your public but in your private life and in your domestic life. And also the word walk kind of also carries with it, does it not, the thought of progress. When you're walking, you're making progress. You're moving. You're not standing still. Notice that Paul did not say, I beseech you to stand still in the Lord. Seriously. So he says, I want you to walk, to move forward. I want you to move ahead toward the goal of full maturity in Jesus Christ. And so we're to walk and to walk a life that is worthy. Now, let's quickly answer this question. Is this optional? Is what the Apostle Paul writes right here under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is this just an optional passage of Scripture? Is this like I can go to a Golden Corral to the buffet? And when you go to the buffet, you may not like everything that's there. In fact, I hope that when you go, you don't literally eat every single item on the buffet. If you do, wow. You may say, oh, pastor, I can see you do. No, I actually don't, believe it or not. I'm actually kind of finicky and picky. <coughs> but I eat some things a lot more. But here's the thing. The Bible is not a buffet. We cannot sit here and take passages like this and say, well, that's optional. That doesn't go with my theology. I'm going to lay that off to the side. Is this optional? Can genuine believers not walk worthy and still be Christian? This is a serious question. Can, can, can we just disobey this but still be in right standing with God? I, 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 you know, and then we ask the question, well, is it us or is it God? Is, God? is God in control of this or am I in control of it or what? And we have to answer these questions. I'm just going to take a minute here. But, but because the way that we answer this can lead to one of two extremes. If we say it's optional, because it's all of God, whatever God's going to do, he's going to do it. I'm just laid out right here. I'm just kind of, okay, God, come and get me, zap me, do whatever. If that is our attitude and we think it's optional, it can lead to license. And what I mean by that is license to sin. Where we all of a sudden say, hey, it's not me. It's God. And yeah, I know God would prefer that I not do this. But it's not going to affect me It's spiritually, my relationship with God. Nothing I do can affect my relationship with God. So, hey, it's okay. The Apostle Paul, believe it or not, he had to deal with this concept of license to sin in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. And this is what he said. He said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Since grace is such a good thing, let's just continue to sin. And of course, we know that the scriptures challenge this. It's a faulty notion that believers can continue in sin and yet remain secure and guilt-free in their salvation because of God's grace. Folks, there's, there, there's nothing biblical about that. It sounds nice, but it's not biblical. 
People who held this misguided view, this is Donald Stamps, and I think it's good, so I'm just quoting him. People who held this misguided view felt that they were not obligated to God's moral law as long as they had faith and relied on God's grace. Paul stands strongly against this twisted view of God's grace by presenting one of the most basic of all spiritual truths about the lives of those who are justified through Christ. This is the truth. Genuine believers are identified as being in Christ because they are dead to sin, but alive to God. And that's Romans 6 and verse 11. Paul says if we are in Christ, how can we continue to live as if we are outside of Christ? It's a huge contradiction. And so if we go with that mindset, we open up Pandora's box and we have license to sin. It doesn't matter. But now here's the problem on the other side. The other extreme is that it's not of God at all, it's all of me. And I have to keep struggling and fighting on my own and it's my willpower and my ability to, to make everything right with God. And if we take that view, then what happens is we end up going the other way where we get into legalism and every sin takes us out of the grace of God. Every, every bad thought, all of a sudden, oh man, I gotta get saved again. I've been in churches, sometimes Pentecostal churches, where the emphasis was such on legalism that there were some people that were coming up and every week, I gotta get saved again. I did something, and, and literally, and they lived this way in this kind of fear where every, everything they did, and it wasn't like they even felt comfortable just taking it before the Lord that night and saying, Lord, it's like they had to get saved all over again. Let me come up and get, no. That's the other extreme. It's not about license and it's not about legalism. It's not about either one of those. John said this in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. If we walk in the light as he, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And now get this, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin, and that word cleanses is in the present tense. In other words, it means as, as we are walking in the light in fellowship with God, even if we do sin, even if it's unintentional, even if it's whatever, there's a continual cleansing of the blood of Jesus. So I'm not losing my salvation every time I sin in word, thought, or deed. So it's not about license, and it's not about legalism. There is a balance here in all of this. Here's the deal. Can I give you a quick little nugget? And, and I'm going to close up here in a minute, but quick little nugget. It will help you so much just in your reading of the Bible and your understanding of Bible doctrine. And I've learned this the hard way over the years. We oftentimes want either or. It's either this or it's that. So it's either license or it's legalism. It's not. It's not either or. It's often both and. Do you hear me? I see that hit like a rock. <laughs> it's not always either or. Oftentimes it's both and. So there are doctrines and there are thoughts of the Lord in this thing where if we get and we say it's only this and then we go in that direction, we miss a whole bunch over here. Or it's only and I'm just going in that direction, we miss a bunch over here. Oftentimes both and is the truth. And we need to understand that and recognize that. And then the, the, the other question that comes up from this of walking worthy is, why is it important? I mean, I've already got my fire insurance. I've already got my, my membership card to this church. I'm saved. I'm not going to hell. What does it matter if I walk worthy or not? The obvious answer is, number one, it matters to people around you because you and I are called to be lights in a darkened world. And it's going to absolutely affect their belief and their thought about God if we're not walking worthy. It's going to affect the beliefs of people in the church. People are going to get discouraged. People are going to get down because, wow, this guy says he's a believer and look at this. And, and again, it promotes the cynicism that I talked about before. But then also the other thing is I, I think it's important for us so that we don't regress and be cut off and die on the vine. And God says, I got to cut you off. There's no fruit here. You've died. You say, well, that can't happen. Read John 15. Jesus is the vine. He's the root of the tree. We're the branches. Our life is in him. And that life is held on by faith and by belief. And if I continue to allow sin, and especially the sin of unbelief in my heart and in my life, eventually I can come to the place where I'm cut off. So you better bet it's a serious thing. It's not optional. And it is a big deal. Amen? amen. Can I get an amen on that? 
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close up here. I like this word worthy. He says, I want you to walk worthy of the calling. That word worthy, we get our word axis. Axios is there. And it literally means to bring up the other beam on the scales. So in other words, don't let one thing weigh you down where one's up here and one's down here. This word to walk worthy means to bring a balance to this. To make sure, in other words, what we're saying is to make sure that the faith that we profess is the faith that we practice. That what we say we believe is what we actually believe. Walk in a manner worthy of our calling. What's the calling? God's calling. It's his plan and his purpose for us. It's to be in Christ. It's to be his. Amen. Not our own. Not our life. His life. Flowing out through us. It's no longer I that live. It's Christ that lives in me. Paul said it in Philippians 3.14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so to walk worthy is our responsibility in daily living. I like it. Philippians 1.27. Paul writes it this way. This is another translation, but it communicates it well. He says just one last thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come to see you or I'm absent, I'll hear about you and that you're standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. So he says, let's live it out. Amen. Let's live it out. So the balance in this whole thing of is it God or is it us when it comes to walking worthy is that it's both and. God has called us, but we have a free will and now we submit that free will to him. And when he calls us to do something, walking by faith means I do. James says, show me a person that says, oh, I'm just, this is my Christianity is my faith. I just talk about it. And James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. It's not either or, it's both and, amen? And so the sum, I love this last verse, and I'll have Brother Ivor come up to the piano. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13 has helped me out so much over the years, and I think this presents the balance to walking worthy. How do we do it, Pastor? What is it all about? Philippians 2, 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Listen to what Paul says. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, giving you the will, giving you the desire and the power to do what he wants. To will and to work for his good pleasure. God's working in us. God's, we, we can't say, has God, does God ever ask anyone to do anything but what he will equip us? Does he ever ask us to do that which is impossible? No. So if you've come in today and you've maybe been discouraged, maybe there's something in your life and you've come to the Lord again and again and again, and you say, wow, I, I know I'm not measuring up and people are telling me I'm not measuring up, and boy, no, afresh and anew today. It's God that is at work in you. Just walk. Doesn't say sprint. The Bible is, never talks about a sprint. It's a, a long-term marathon. Sometimes we're just walking, but make progress. Make progress in your life. Move toward that high calling the Lord has called us with. Amen. Let's live it out. Let's walk worthy. Again, I remind you as we close the first three chapters of this book, we've been adopted into God's family. We've been made citizens of heaven. But now we're exhorted that in light of this incredible new reality, we have to live lives appropriate to our new calling. It must be. Can't be optional. We just do it. We, we give in to the Lord and say, God, begin that work in me. How many would just say again, afresh and anew today? Yes, I want the Lord to continue to work on me because I want to walk worthy of the call. How many want to walk worthy of the calling? Amen. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I just today, Lord, would ask that you would remind all of us that change is possible, that we can be encouraged as we leave today because, Lord, that which you call us to, you equip us for. You never, ever, ever tell us to do something that is impossible to do with your help. No. When you call us to something, you equip us. And so I pray today, every one of us here, we want to walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called. We have been made new people in Jesus Christ. 
We are a part of his building, a part of his body. We are his people. We want to walk worthy, Lord. We realize it's a walk. It's not a sprint. It's just a walk. But we want to walk with a balanced life that what we say we believe and how we live out our life, that they match, that there's a balance there. So minister to your people, Lord. Take us to our different homes safely, Lord. Meet every need that's in this place. Take care of every single one of us. Again, we pray for brothers and sisters that are not feeling well, that you would touch them and bring healing to them. And Lord, we'll just love you and thank you and honor you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you are going to continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen and amen.